Hello, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for watching an overview of EpiCal TTA presented by the EpiCal Training and Technical Assistance Center, or TTA. My name is Jessica Windhouse, and I'm the EpiCal TTA project manager. My email is available right there on the screen at jrwindhouse at ucdavis.edu. Our learning objectives for today, understand the origin, structure, and mission of EpiCal, understand the psychosis continuum and how it relates to EpiCal, including EP, FEP, and CHRP, Understand the purpose of the EPICAL Training and Technical Assistance Center, or TTA. Understand the different grants and funding streams participating in EPICAL TTA. Understand the coordinated specialty care model. Understand the rationale for TTA based on psychosis incidents and the current landscape of early psychosis care in California. Understand what services the TTA provides and what is expected of EP programs participating in the TTA. Okay, let's talk about what is EPICAL. EPICAL stands for California Early Psychosis Intervention. Our goals at EPICAL are to support provision of high quality early psychosis care to all Californians and to promote recovery and better outcomes through a learning healthcare network approach. EPICAL is a county and provider driven initiative. Our leadership is actively engaged in providing clinical services in community mental health settings. Before we talk more about EPICAL, let's talk briefly about psychosis. So what is psychosis? So the key symptoms of psychosis include hallucinations, which are sensory experiences that are not related to what is happening around you, Delusions, which are thoughts or beliefs that are held with conviction in the face of contradictory evidence. Thought disorder, which is difficulty communicating or behaving in a linear and goal-directed manner. And it's important to note that these experiences must cause significant distress or functional impairment in the client. So let's talk about early psychosis or EP, first episode psychosis or FEP, and clinical high-risk psychosis, or CHR or CHRP. So here in California, we understand psychosis as a continuum. We use the term early psychosis, or EP, to represent the continuum of psychosis from a clinical high-risk, or CHR, to individuals who have experienced threshold or first episode psychosis, or FEP. Other states and other agencies may treat FEP differently. Now let's look at the psychosis continuum. First, we have the low end of the continuum. So this is within cultural norms. This includes no distress, infrequent or rare symptoms, no effect on behavior or functioning, and behavior that's consistent with cultural beliefs. It's important to note that everyone has these experiences at some point in their lives. Then we're getting into attenuated psychosis. So we're starting to increase in frequency of symptoms, perhaps weekly. We're experiencing some distress that bothers us. We're able to question reality, and it at this point has little effect on behavior. This is at the low end of the psychosis continuum. On the higher end of the continuum, it's increasing in frequency in terms of symptoms, so weekly or daily. Increasing distress, it seems real because it keeps happening, but the client is not quite convinced. And then it's starting to affect the client's behavior or impact functioning. And then finally, the other end of the spectrum is fully psychotic. This is significant distress frequent as in weekly or daily symptoms. They are convinced that what they're experiencing is real. It affects their behavior and it impairs functioning. It bothers this person. So that is the full spectrum. So down here at the bottom, we have things that we all experience from time to time within cultural norms. And then up here at the top, fully psychotic. EPICAL program director, Dr. Tara Neendem will now talk about epidemiology and how common psychotic symptoms are in the general population. Then she'll start to talk about the presence of illness and the psychosis continuum. Yes. 
Today, I'm going to be talking about understanding psychosis. Um, it's found in about 2% psychosis. I'm just talking about psychosis, right? Not schizophrenia, psychosis. 2% of the population worldwide. If we were to look <clears throat> in Sacramento County alone and look at incidents, so new cases of psychosis, um, there was this really great paper that came out um, last year by Radigan. This came out of the New York group looking in Medicaid data. Um, it is much lower if you look at commercial insurance data. So if you look at Medicaid, the estimate, the low estimate was 272 per 100,000 new cases per year. So in Sacramento County, based on our 2018 census, that would be 4,191 people in our county. Again, that's the low estimate from that paper. Um, if you look in, um, and so this is, this is a really hot topic for us um, as we try to make sure we have a, enough service for folks. And what many of our programs are seeing is they're inundated. There's more people than there's staff to handle. And it's because we were under, underestimating the number of new cases that we should see each year. The old estimate was 80, around 80 per 100,000. So um, as going as low as 31 per 100,000. So, you know, really we've been underestimating. It's more common in men than women. Um, we usually tend to see a 60, 40, 65, 35 split in, in our clinic. Um, but there's questions about that, that there may be more women in the community. But as you see down here on one of the lower bullets, they tend to have a later onset. So the average age of onset for women is 22, and for men it's 17 to 18 years old. So here you have young men who are experiencing the onset of these very significant symptoms, like as they're graduating from high school, um, whereas women have a little bit more time maybe to get to college, to get stable in a job, you know, to kind of get stable in the community before they become ill. And so there's a hypothesis that often that's this earlier age of onset that tends to create more men having more difficulty, which means they present more often for care. Whereas women may have, because they've had a later onset, some more time for brain development, again, establishing themselves in the community, they're able to manage a little bit better. So the mean age of onset is 20. We really talk about, if we wanna talk about a normal distribution, right? So we have 20 here, right in the middle. And then 15 to 35 is kind of getting down to those tails. We go, um, we go up to 30 in our, um, our insurance or our Medicaid clinic. We go up to 40 in our insurance clinic and you will see women in that tail. You will have more women having onset later um, than men. We go down to 12 um, because we do see earlier onset as well, but very early onset before puberty. It's uncommon, but it does happen. And you guys will see it. Um, now that you know what psychosis looks like, you will see it in, in kiddos. Um, and we get calls for eight, nine, 10 and 11 year old olds who are having psychotic symptoms. Um, psychotic like symptoms are very common. Um, if we were to go out into the community and survey folks, we will see that between one in four and one in five will endorse having a psychotic like experience at some time in their life. And that is because, as I mentioned before, psychotic symptoms are on a spectrum from within normal human experience all the way up to fully psychotic, I need treatment. Just like depression, just like anxiety, just like substance use, psych psychosis is no different. So um, this sort of is a prototypical example of how we tend to see the onset of these symptoms. So here we've got positive symptoms in black, negative symptoms in blue, Here's this at-risk phase. So I was sort of talking about this or alluding to this in response to one of my questions, um, to one of the questions you all sent me before, is we see this ramping up of these symptoms, okay? And this shows us that the negative symptoms start before and get worse before the positive symptoms. So we've got folks who are blah, disinterested, unmotivated before they have odd thoughts or perceptual experiences, okay? We see this ramping up to what we would call acute psychosis, which may last a week to a month. And then hopefully someone gets some treatment. This is accurate diagnosis and treatment, not inaccurate diagnosis and treatment. And what we see here is um, a remission of positive symptoms. Most of our medications, which tend to be the first line, um, work okay for 
many people, not all people, um, in reducing the hallucinations and the delusions, um, but we see a persistence of negative symptoms. Medications don't work for negative symptoms. Um, that's where psychosocial treatments are really important. So when we're talking about the early phase of psychosis, we're really looking at this early stage right here at the beginning um, to get in as early as possible to put treatment in place to get folks um, back on track. So um, that's because this period, the duration of untreated psychosis is right now the best predictor we have of outcome. So the longer someone goes in the community without adequate treatment, the poorer is their outcome. Um, so if we can get people into appropriate care sooner, we will get them back on track. So this is one thing that for our clinic and clinics like ours is a really important target for intervention. And that is because here in the United States, the average duration of untreated psychosis is 18 and a half months. That's a year and a half. If this were cancer, people would be dying. Um, so I, I want you to really think that people are out there in our community, hearing voices, having paranoid thoughts, not functioning well for a year and a half on average before they get treated. Um, I have met individuals who, where it's been years, people haven't to appropriately diagnose or treated them for years. Um, and this is common in, um, in the United States. It's worse when you go out into rural and remote regions. Um, and again, I would point to stigma as well as a lack of understanding of what psychosis looks like and how to do good differential diagnosis as reasons that are contributing to this. If we were go to go to Australia or the United Kingdom, the um, average there is three months. The UK is trying to push it to eight weeks. Um, and in both of those countries, they have national early psychosis programs so that you can get access across the country. Um, everything here is state by state and county by county. So there's a very significant lack of access to appropriate care as well. So as I mentioned, this early psychosis phase, that first five years after the onset is critical in terms of getting people into care. And that's because oftentimes in that stage, people still are functioning. They may be in school, they may have a job, they might not be functioning very well, but they have it, they have friends, they have family. And so what we're trying to do is help them maintain those things, bolster them within those settings so that they can continue to you know, improve and, and um, recover while maintaining these things, as opposed to waiting till they're gone. And now we're trying to recover them. So, you know, the longer you let it go, the more those um, networks, those social networks, the job, the school, those things are going to fall away. And then you're trying to put those things back into place. And that's much, much harder to do. Here's some data that shows um, relapse, so a return of fully psychotic positive symptoms. So you can see here in blue, these are individuals where it was a year or more, so they had a long DUP versus individuals who are identified within a year of onset, um, here shorter DUP, they're in orange. And you can see within six months of intake, both groups look about the same, one in five have had a relapse, but it's really that long-term outcome that matters. So for those individuals who were identified early, 40% have had a relapse by two years versus 80% when there was a delay in getting care. So really that year or more, you're looking at you're two times more likely to have a relapse, which often results in hospitalization. So this is some, some data. Course of illness, again, early functioning tends to be the best predictor of later functioning. So looking at how they were before their illness started, it should help you set your treatment goals for where you're headed in treatment. Right now, in, um, if we were to look at disability rates in schizophrenia, because of the lack of adequate care in the United States, we see that 20% of Social Security benefits are used to care for individuals with schizophrenia. So something that affects 2% of the population requires 20% of Social Security benefits. And this is often because, again, individuals are impacted at such an early stage in their life when you're trying to establish independence, get a further education, get a job, start a family, that's when the illness is starting. And so once they're stable, they've come, they come out on the other side of this developmental period, 
and they've missed so many like opportunities or, or chances to develop their skills that it becomes harder to get them back into the workforce or back into education. And so individuals end up on disability um, and then um, stay because they don't have the skills um, and, and treatment hasn't supported them towards recovery. Um, 25 to 50% of individuals with psychosis, with schizophrenia, will attempt suicide, 10% will complete. So this is very high risk in the early phase of the illness. Remember, we talked about this concern that people were violent towards other people. That's not the case. Individuals with psychosis are more likely to be a victim of violence, and they're also more likely to aggress against themselves than against other people. That's why this is so important for the work that we do, you know, being very proactive in monitoring for suicide risk. The most important part of this slide is that recovery is possible. We are not just trying to recover, control their symptoms. We are trying to hold the hope for them that they will be able to get well, be independent, and be able to pursue a meaningful life. That, again, is what everyone wants. And so that is our goal in, in providing treatment, is to get people back to where they want to be. Um, one of the most important other predictors besides DUP is engagement with family and support persons. So for those of you who may work predominantly in adult system of care, um, for individuals with psychotic disorders or other serious mental illnesses, the ability to build their natural support network is one of the best predictors of outcome for them. We tend to take this like, oh, confidentiality, HIPAA, I can't talk to other people. You're doing your client a disservice by not getting those releases of information to help reinforce and educate their support network because that's who's supporting them when you're not around. So we really need to um, support the families or other chosen families that these folks have to buffer them for stress in the community. All right, when do the early signs of psychosis occur? Um, the earliest signs, those at-risk signs, appear one to three years prior to full psychosis. So there's this bubbling that we see as people head towards a full psychotic episode. Why does it happen during this age, this sort of early adolescence? Why does it take this time? There are aspects of brain maturation that are happening that um, are critical for um, appropriate, typically developing brain function. But for these individuals, something in that system has gone awry. Um, and that, um, so that developmental period is leading them to cross a threshold into psychosis. Um, I mentioned before that it's psychotic symptoms exist on this continuum from sub-threshold to fully psychotic. So these early signs look like changes in thought or experience, behavior, and functioning. So we talk about instead of hallucinations, we say perceptual abnormalities. Instead of delusions, we say unusual beliefs. Instead of bizarre behavior, we'll say uncharacteristic behaviors. You know, we don't want to use the same terminology because the person isn't at that level yet. We're talking about these attenuated symptoms. So when I talk about this psychosis continuum, you know, I talk about things being within cultural norms. So these are experiences, again, that many of us have had that don't really, that we don't get distressed, it happens infrequently, it doesn't really affect your behavior, and it's consistent with cultural beliefs. So again, feeling your cell phone vibrate um, or hearing it ring when it actually didn't vibrate or ring. I'm sure if I asked folks on you know, this training to raise their hand, many people would do so. This happens. It happens when we're tired or stressed. We don't take our phone apart and think that someone's communicating with us. We just say, ugh, I'm so tired. I need to get some sleep. It's within our cultural experience. Um, so then we have fully psychotic. So these experiences, they're happening frequently. They cause us distress. We think it's real. And as a result, it affects our behavior and our functioning. Two ends of a continuum. What happens in between is what we call attenuated or sub-threshold psychosis. So at the lowest end, we would think about something that is increasing in frequency. Maybe it's happening once a week. And as a result, we're wondering what's going on. Why do, why do I keep thinking my phone is ringing when it's not ringing? What's wrong? You know, and so we start to question it. We start to wonder. We are meaning makers as humans. When we see patterns, we try to make sense of them. Okay. And so maybe there'll be some distress. Maybe I'll go to my, my husband and I'll say, I keep thinking my phone's ringing. Has this been happening? Is something wrong? You know, and he'll be like, no, and I'll sort of keep wondering about it. 
I'm able to question it. I'm able to doubt it. It's not really going to affect my behavior in a major way, but it's bothering me. Then maybe things start happening more often. And as a result, you see this increase in distress. It's starting to seem real. There's something going on that my phone, I keep feeling it vibrate when it's not vibrating. Something is happening, but I'm still not convinced. And it may be starting to impact my behavior or my functioning. So this is this continuum that goes from within cultural norms all the way up to fully psychotic. I'm going to give you an example. It's a personal example. Um, it's um, about ghosts. I love ghosts. I grew up in the South. We love ghosts. I'm sorry. They're, they're amazing. I've been on ghost hunting tours. I've watched, uh, you know, ghost hunting shows. I have a bunch of books on ghosts. It's like totally a thing. So, um, I, and it's also very culturally prevalent. So I think it's a good example. So within cultural norms. So when I was 12, um, my grandmother lived in um, my neighborhood. She had a house in my neighborhood. She was my primary caregiver when my mom was at work. Um, and um, so I was very close to her. She passed away. And so we were staying at the house and packing it up um, after her funeral. And I had a room there with a bed and that my bed when the door was open looked down the hallway. So um, after her funeral, um, you know, we went back, we were packing things up and we, we stayed there that night and I went to sleep in the middle of the night. I woke up for no reason. And I sat up and I looked down the hall and I saw my grandmother standing there and she smiled at me and she disappeared. Now for me, that wasn't unusual. That was within cultural norms. The next morning I woke up and I was like, mom, I saw grandma last night. She smiled at me. My mom was like, that's fantastic. That means she's at peace. So in my culture, that was interpreted as a very, you know, helpful experience. Nobody tried to put me on Risperdal or take me to the hospital. It was something that happened one time. I felt comforted. It didn't change my behavior. It was consistent, you know, with my family's beliefs. Um, so this is very common, very common after stressful situations, loss of a loved one, people smell, hear, feel a loved one. Um, so, you know, this is a good example of something that might seem psychotic, but really isn't. Now let's pretend that after that, I started seeing shadowy figures a few times a month. So I was 12, you know, and I, I, I would lay there in bed at night and I would see these shadowy figures and, and I didn't know why. Um, you know, I, it made me sort of nervous. I, I, I wasn't sure. I talked to my mom. She was like, Ooh, this is, this is different. This, this hasn't happened. Um, hmm, this is concerning. And it was making it hard for me to fall asleep. This is an example of that lower end of attenuated symptoms of that clinical high risk range. And these are kiddos we serve in our clinic too. So this would be an appropriate referral to us. Now let's pretend that I'm now seeing them daily. And, um, you know, I'm starting to sort of wonder if maybe I'm seeing ghosts or maybe the dead are trying to communicate with me. So I could have two different interpretations of this same experience. I could see it as exciting. I could think I might have a special gift, a more grandiose interpretation. Or I could be terrified. I could think these are demons that are trying to get me and I could be very, very scared. So you can see how that cognitive interpretation of the same experience creates different emotional reactions. So let's pretend I'm going the more grandiose route and I have a special gift. So I'm starting to wonder if I can communicate with them. So I'm laying there at night and I'm trying in my mind to communicate and see if I can get these shadowy figures to move. And maybe they move, maybe they don't. And again, this isn't consistent with my family's beliefs. And I'm, I'm tired in the morning. It's starting to impact my schoolwork. This is moving up that continuum of psychosis. So now if we want to illustrate this at the psychotic level, you know, each day, I think I see these shadowy figures or even fully formed figures of people who've died. I believe that I can communicate with them. And I, you know, try to talk to them at night. I, I sit up at night talking. And as a result, I'm not able to go to school anymore. You know, my family is telling me that this isn't happening. And um, so I get angry and I lash out at them. So it's causing me a lot of problems at school and with my family. This is the level at which we would think someone has psychosis and is, is needing 
more significant treatment. Okay, so hopefully that helps everyone to kind of see this continuum. And and um, I'm sort of wondering how many of you now are, are have seen clients before where you're like, oh. <laughs> that person had attenuated psychosis, or wow, I, I now think that person might have been fully psychotic. Or it could be conversely. Man, we thought that was psychosis, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe there were some cultural factors or other experiential factors that were contributing. Important issues to consider developmental norms. Again, we've talked about younger kids or non-typically developing kids where thinking about thinking is really difficult. So I, I've given you some examples of how to be more concrete. Do they hear those voices outside their head? Like they hear my voice now. Do they identify that voice as someone different than their own internal monologue? I also think it's very helpful to look at the effect on behavior. When you're talking to the voices, in that moment, you think they're real. If you do something differently because of your beliefs, you think that they're real. Some behaviors are normal for younger children, but not adolescents. This is also developmental appropriateness. Imaginary friends in a four-year-old, likely normal. Imaginary friends in a 14-year-old, I wanna talk to them. That is much more unusual. So really making sure some, and sometimes families can make attributions about it. They're very creative. They live in this world of characters. And, and really they could be living in a world of hallucinations and not having friends or not going to school because of it. Um, we talked about the cultural and familial context, that belief in ghosts or other religious experiences. There are religions who believe that talking to ghosts is normal. So how does your client's experience differ from their larger community or their religious community? Um, are there behaviors or are there thoughts in some ways unusual to other folks who believe similarly? And then environmental factors. Um, you know, they, they may be concerned about their safety, but is that realistic? Is, are they being bullied? Are they in an unsafe neighborhood? Those are realistic concerns that shouldn't be ascribed to paranoia. Um, and so one of the things I like to ask is, do their symptoms occur outside of a particular context? Where are places they felt safe in the past? You know, do they worry about others' intentions in those contexts when those places have been safe to them? It's when you start to see that generalization that it, it can be a little bit more clear that it's psychosis. What else might I see? These specific psychosis symptoms occur alongside a variety of nonspecific clinical issues. People come into the clinic because they're not able to cope, you know, they're struggling to cope with life. They might not be doing well in work or school. They're having trouble concentrating. Maybe they're withdrawn from being friends or they're having trouble taking care of themselves. You know, they come in saying, I'm depressed. And so really our goal as clinicians is to pull back that curtain of the initial presentation and say, what else could be going on? Okay, you're telling me it's depression. Well, have there been these other experiences? Is there trauma? Is there substance? Is there psychosis? Really just making sure we do a very thorough evaluation because folks with psychosis generally don't walk into me and say, hi, I'm hearing some voices and I'd like some help for it. They come in saying, I have all of these challenges. And by the way, there's some voices too. If you want to see the full Understanding Psychosis Early Identification and Treatment video, it's available here at this YouTube link. So go ahead and pause this video if you want to grab this link. Now let's talk about a brief history of our project, EpiCal. So about EpiCal. Based on an average incidence of psychotic illness of 272 per 100,000 people each year, approximately 107,000 California residents are expected to experience a first psychotic episode each year. So although California currently has active programs providing early psychosis services across multiple counties, these programs offer different services, follow different treatment models, and measure treatment impact differently. For this reason, EpiCal was created. In 2017, AB 1315 legislation created the EpiPlus grant. Governor Jerry Brown approved California AB 1315 legislation in 2017, mandating that the MHSOAC, which is the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission, create and oversee a committee to expand provision of high quality evidence-based early psychosis and mood disorder detection and intervention services in California. 
the MHSOAC established Early Psychosis Intervention Plus Committee that includes psychotic conditions plus mood disorders with psychotic features. And they created the EPI Plus grant, which provided money to counties looking to improve existing early psychosis programs or create new ones. So EPI Plus means early psychosis plus mood disorders with psychotic features. In 2018, EPICAL was born. EPICAL started as a collaboration between several California counties, including Los Angeles, San Diego, Orange, Solano, and Napa, and One Mind to develop a learning healthcare network for the EP programs of those counties. A grant from NIH, that's the National Institutes of Health, brought the California Learning Healthcare Network, or LHCN, into the national network of EP programs, EPINET. This grant also made it possible to add county and university EP programs into the LHCN. In 2021, the TTA project began when the MHSOAC invested through the EPI Plus grant and added counties to the EPICAL TTA. So we can see in dark blue, we have more counties added. In 2022, DHCS, or Department of Healthcare Services Investment, through MHBG, that's Mental Health Block Grant Supplemental Grants, ARPA, and SIRSA, adds 22 counties to the EPICAL TTA. So you can see the counties in yellow here were added from 2021. And finally, in 2023, DHCS continued their investment in our program and added 11 counties to both EPICAL LHCN and the TTA through MHBG prime funding. We now have 36 out of 58 counties participating in EPICAL in California, and we are very excited. As you can see, there's been a lot of change between 2018 and 2023. Our goal is to have every county in California included. We recognize that this is a challenging prospect, but we would love to work with every single county to help figure out how to sustainably grow their early psychosis program. Now that you know about our history, let's talk more about the EPICAL structure, so the structure of our program. The EPICAL program is comprised of two different initiatives, as we've already alluded to. It includes the LHCN, which is the Learning Healthcare Network, and the TTA. The TTA, which is the Training and Technical Assistance Center, provides training and technical assistance to support implementation and sustainability of EP programs. And the Learning Healthcare Network harmonizes outcomes data collection and standardizes practices and supports knowledge sharing. We'll dive more into this in a moment. Our hope is that all of the counties that we work with will participate in both TTA and Learning Healthcare Network as these two projects work together to improve client outcomes. The Training and Technical Assistance Center, through providing training and technical assistance that can improve client outcomes through fidelity to the coordinated specialty care model, improving the early psychosis programs of the counties we're working with. Whereas the Learning Healthcare Network harmonizes outcomes data collection and standardizes practice and supports knowledge sharing so that we can collect outcomes data. So our hope is that the outcomes data collected in the LHCN will improve training and technical assistance within the TTA and that the training and technical assistance provided at the TTA will improve client outcomes measured at the Learning Healthcare Network. Counties or programs participate in TTA and or LHCN through different funding mechanisms. Some counties are associated with more than one funding mechanism. For example, Sonoma County is involved in EpiPlus, MHBG Supplemental Funding, Learning Healthcare Network, and EpiCal R01. About the Learning Healthcare Network. The goal of the Learning Healthcare Network is to increase the quality of early psychosis services, including measurable outcomes. This is the structure of the Learning Healthcare Network for EP programs within California. At the consumer level, Consumers and their support, including family or other support persons, enter data on relevant survey tools in threshold languages in an app-based platform called Beehive at baseline and then regular follow-up intervals. Then at the provider level, the clinician or MD can visualize responses on this web-based Beehive portal for the individual over the course of treatment and share that data with the consumer during the session. At the clinic level, 
program management can visualize a summary of responses on the portal for all consumers in the clinic and in relation to other California programs. Then at the state level, the administrator level within Beehive allows access to a limited data set across all clinics on the app for county or state level data analysis. So again, the purpose here is to harmonize outcomes data collection and standardize practice and support knowledge sharing to improve the quality of EP services and measure the impact of treatment. And that is largely accomplished using our application mentioned in the slide, Beehive. So now that you understand EpiCal as a whole, the remainder of this presentation will focus on the EpiCal TTA, which is the Training and Technical Assistance Center. So let's learn about the EpiCal TTA. The TTA currently consists of two different funding streams, as we saw before in the last infographic. That is EPI Plus and MHBG Supplemental Funds, that's SIRSA and ARPA. Each county or EP program is a recipient of at least one of these two grants. Some counties may receive both grants. So here at the TTA, our mission is to provide training and technical assistance to support implementation and sustainability of EP programs across California. Our goals are to support provision of high quality early psychosis care to all Californians and to promote recovery and better outcomes through a learning healthcare network approach. Our team at the TTA is presented by UC Davis, and it is a collaboration with our colleagues at UC San Francisco and Stanford University. Again, your main point of contact will be me, the project manager, Jessica Windhouse. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to me at jrwindhouse at ucdavis.edu. Our sponsors. So EpiCal receives funding from many different counties through the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission, One Mind, the Department of Healthcare Services, and the National Institute of Mental Health. So big thank you to our sponsors for making this happen. Let's talk about CSC or the Coordinated Specialty Care Model. All grantees participating in the EpiCal TTA are expected to provide services consistent with the Coordinated Specialty Care Model or CSC which is a team-based program providing an array of evidence-based interventions for recent onset or first episode psychosis. Now here we have the original CSE model tested by RAISE in 2014. So this includes the client in the center of the model. We have medication and primary care, psychotherapy, family education and support, supported education and employment, and case management as different services offered as part of the coordinated specialty care model. Now, our CSC model is a little different from the RAISE CSC model. It focuses both on the client and their family or caregivers or support. It also uses assertive case management and includes peers and family partners, community outreach and education, and weekly team meetings to improve client outcomes. The weekly team meeting is an important component of the CSC model. Different providers, different folks working at a coordinated specialty care model program want to make sure that they are coming to a consensus, touching base on different clients, and generally provided coordinated care. We like to provide assertive case management to ensure positive outcomes for our clients. We also want to center the client and their family as their family or caregivers or support will be instrumental in ensuring their wellness and their path towards recovery or management of their symptoms. Peer and family partners are especially important. Those with lived experience provide invaluable knowledge towards providing quality healthcare services to folks experiencing psychosis. And then lastly, community outreach and education is especially important. There is a lot of stigma against psychosis and we want to prevent that as much as possible and provide outreach to folks so that we can catch the folks who are experiencing psychotic symptoms so that we can treat them and provide them with the happiest and fullest lives that we can. How is CSC different from normal community mental health care? CSC is a targeted team-based intervention specifically for treating psychotic symptoms early in the course of illness to preserve functioning and prevent deterioration with the goal of improving overall life satisfaction, functioning, and outcomes. It also focuses on individuals with threshold psychosis, 
but it can also be used with CHRP or clinical high risk for psychosis. However, the CSC model has not been tested on this population. If your EP program decides to accept clinical high-risk clients, this should be in addition to serving FEP, which is the highest need population, not instead of. So that is an important note if you are forming your EP program. Let's talk about outcomes without coordinated specialty care model and get more into the rationale of why we do what we do. Without good care, we can expect to see a life expectancy 10 to 20 years below average for folks experiencing psychosis with an increased risk for premature mortality. This is also related to significant medical comorbidities and high rates of substance use. Rates of death by suicide range from 4% to 13% and is most common during the early phase of illness. Rates of unemployment can be as high as 90% with a high risk for homelessness, poverty, and an overall poor quality of life. These experiences also complicate treatment and the recovery process. The annual economic burden can be approximately 155.7 billion, which is at 44,773 annual average cost per individual. So obviously these are the things that we are trying to prevent. So to recap the reason that EpiCal was created, based on an average incidence of psychotic illness of 272 per 100,000 people each year, approximately 107,000 Californians are estimated to experience a first psychotic episode each year. Obviously, that is a substantial number of Californians, so we want to be sure that we are serving these folks as early in the course of illness as we can. Let's look at the estimated incidence rates per county and how to staff your early psychosis program according to those incidence rates. Let's take a look at psychosis incidence rates examples based on the 2020 census. What we've done here is we've pulled a few different counties with very different populations. We have Inyo County here with a population of about 18,000. El Dorado County with a population of 192,000 and Los Angeles with a population of 9.7 million. So you can see the different populations of FEP incidences who have Medi-Cal insurance, FEP without insurance, and then privately insured FEP clients. So in Inyo County, for instance, FEP with Medi-Cal, that's four people. However, in Los Angeles County, we're looking at 200,923 new cases of first episode psychosis with Medi-Cal alone per year. FEP without insurance, two for Inyo, nine for El Dorado, 958 for Los Angeles. And then we have privately insured FEP, two for Inyo, 31 for El Dorado, 1,698 for Los Angeles. So then we have the total estimated new FEP cases per year, eight for Inyo County, 69 for El Dorado County, and 5,579 for Los Angeles County. So each of these EP programs at each of these different counties need to be prepared to try to handle this number of people based on the 2020 census, based on the population of their county, and the expected estimated incidence of first psychosis diagnosis in these populations. Now let's talk about program staffing estimations for your early psychosis program based on incidence rates. So we have a calculator that can help counties participating in the TTA do these calculations for their own counties as you're working on establishing or building or improving your early psychosis program to serve more folks. So here, for instance, we have listed the title that should be included in every early psychosis program for fidelity to the CSC model, along with the different roles and the estimated FTE and what that means. So here, for instance, for a clinician, for a one FTE, we're looking at one biweekly intake and 16 to 18 cases. Now let's look at EP program staffing estimator based on incidence rates. So this is just an example. This is not a particular county. We're talking about 100 new total cases of psychosis per year. So imagine your county has approximately 100 new cases of psychosis per year. You will need a physician with an FTE of one, same with your nurse and your program manager or team lead. For a clinician, 6.3 FTE, 
Case Manager, 2.5 FTE. Peer, 1.8 FTE. Same for Family Partner and Cs and Clinic Coordinator, 2.0 FTE. You'll also need to accommodate time for supervision, team meeting, administrative support for outreach, and clinic coordinators. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about staffing your early psychosis program and what it takes to stand up a program like this based on the population that you're serving. We will help counties participating in TTA to do these calculations for their own counties. Now that you know more about what it takes to create or sustain an early psychosis program, we'll talk more about what the TTA provides, starting with TTA training. Our training content covers evidence-based assessment and treatment of individuals experiencing early psychosis with a particular focus on fidelity to the CSC model. We offer EP program staff a suite of trainings on CSC components. Most are available for online or on-demand training. We offer CME and CEU credit for 21 of our learning modules, and we've created custom learning paths for different clinic roles to suit individual need. We also provide drop-in trainings and learning collaboratives based on grantee requests and feedback, which allow for opportunities to discuss with other EP program staff within California. We don't expect you to read this whole list, but just to give you an idea for how many trainings we provide, this is a few of them. Now let's talk about our learning management system, Cornerstone. Cornerstone is a software application for the delivery, tracking, reporting, and administration of educational courses and trainings. This is where all of our trainings will be. Cornerstone will allow you to attend both live and asynchronous or on-demand trainings. It also allows you to take trainings specific to your role within your clinic anytime in the order they should be taken. Cornerstone will also track your progress in each training so that you do not have to do that or your manager does not have to do that. Let's talk about technical assistance. So in terms of technical assistance, we're looking mostly at ongoing consultation, which is the main form of technical assistance that we provide. We provide regular consultation meetings with each county EP program to monitor progress towards TTA goals and assist counties with any challenges experienced within their EP program. Topics include staffing, training on CSC components, billing and documentation, medication management, eligibility and screening criteria and procedures, program and team structure, coordinated team care, in-reach, referrals, outreach, development of targeted materials and psychoeducation, enrollment, participation in the Learning Healthcare Network, CSC Fidelity and Fidelity Assessments, and funding. Now let's talk about your TTA plans. At the start of the grant period, each grantee completes self-assessments as part of the grant application to give the EPICAL TTA team a sort of snapshot of each EP program's needs, strengths, weaknesses, etc. These assessments are then used to draft a TTA plan. TTA plans set annual goals towards improving fidelity to the CSC model for specific program components based on the strengths, weaknesses, and resources of EP programs. These plans include staffing, training, and overall goals for EP programs, including CSC components for improvement. Grantees provide input on the plan goals and report progress during each consultation meeting with our team at EPICAL TTA, and we then report your progress on your TTA goals to the sponsor, which can be either DHCS, MHSOAC, or both, depending on what grant your county receives. Now let's talk about fidelity assessment. Fidelity is the degree to which an activity is delivered consistent to evidence-based practice, or EBP. TT fidelity assessments measure how closely each program is delivering coordinated specialty care in accordance with evidence-based practices against a set of objective criteria. Grantee improvement on fidelity scores over time is the primary outcome metric for the TTA. So we want to ensure that you are improving thanks to our training and technical assistance. So you are moving closer to fidelity to the CSC model. Fidelity assessments are crucial in identifying areas of strength and opportunities for growth within each program, informing TTA goals and the nature of support our program provides. 
identifying potential for data to support county and funder dialogue, and evaluating the impact of the TTA on the improvements that programs achieve over time. For each assessment, we utilize the FEPS FS version 1.1, which is the first episode psychosis service fidelity scale, and the CHRPS or the CHIRPS, which assess fidelity to best practices delivered by a team that provides treatment and care for clients with first episode psychosis, or treatment and care for clients with first episode psychosis or CHRP or clinical high risk for psychosis. Assessments are conducted using admin data, patient numbers and staffing, health record data, components common to all patients, interviews with clinic staff, clinical services, and staff training provided. At the end of the assessment, we provide each clinic with a detailed report of the findings, including a summary of program strengths and possible modifications that could be made to deliver early psychosis care consistent with current best practices. We do provide counties and programs with more details on the fidelity assessment process when it's time to schedule your program's fidelity assessment. Okay. That was a lot of information and we have plenty more information available for you in Cornerstone. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, Jessica Windhouse at jrwindhouse at ucdavis.edu. Thank you so much for joining me for this orientation to the EpiCal TTA and have a wonderful day.